Okay students, so uh, second in the series of uh, videos for metaphysical poetry, we're on to the next John Donne poem in the collection, which is uh, The Good Morrow. One of the things you might notice about this poem, which is very, very different from the first one, which we studied The Flea, is that this is actually um, a love poem. It's not a poem of seduction, it's not designed to try and get someone into bed in that quite base way that we did with the first poem, The Flea. This is a, a love poem and it's about the nature of love and the exploration, a very deep, rich metaphysical exploration of the nature of love. Okay, so I'll just have a wee sip of coffee and we'll start. So the first thing to notice about the poem, once again, having a think about structure. Structure is always really important with poetry, as long as you can say something interesting about it. So here, one of the things to note, of course, is the rhyme scheme. I and then, childish li or li, and den, and then b, c, and the, and similar again, soul, sphere, controls, where, gone, and shone, and won. Okay, so souls, controls, sphere, and we're everywhere, appears, spheres, rest, west, equally I die. So there's this sense of having a quatrain, four lines, and then a triplet. Okay, so sort of an AB, AB structure, four lines where the first and third line and the second and fourth line rhyme, and then a triplet. And once again, we've got this quite uniform structure to the poem, which is important. We have three stanzas, okay? Very important that we recognize the structural features. Three stanzas, quite a uniform structure. And once again, there's quite a simplicity in register. So there's a quite a sort of down-to-earth conversational quality. So again, to the poem, similar to the flea, but the ideas in it are really, really rich and complicated. Okay, so let's go through stanza by stanza and see what's going on in terms of this poem. I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we lived, loved. So you can say, oh look, there's some enjambment or whatever, but let's think about the important things in terms of medical, phys metaphysical poetry. I, my, I, and we, in that sense. Thou did till we loved. So there's lots of, sort of personal pronouns reflecting the personal nature of the poem, the, the personal nature of love. I wonder by troth what we thought and I did till we loved. So it starts with this sort of questioning. Look at all the question marks that we see in that first quatrain. Yeah? What did we do before we were in love? Were we not weaned till then? Childish, suck sucked in that sense, possibly suckled, but um, uh, snored in the seven sleepers den. So we've got this sibilance and we've got this semantic field, field of like innocence and childishness, uh, um, semantic field sort of childhood. Now, that, that's, that's quite an interesting starting point. It's almost like saying before we were in love, we were like children, or all our other loves were like children. So this idea of snorted, that snoring, you were like your sleeping children, uh, sucked on country's pleasures childishly, the sense of that the pleasures were sort of quite parochial, quite simplistic, the ch before true love. So really we've got this sort of childhood innocence going on, but at the same time you should be aware that sucked on country pleasures actually also has sexual connotations as well. Shakespeare um, uses his uh, country pleasures in a um, sexual connotations um, in a similar way. So um, there's, a, there's a definite sense of, of um, something, <laughs> do you know what, I don't want to put this in the YouTube video, this is what I'm worried about. You can see the word country pleasures, I hope you can see what I'm talking about. There is a sexual connotation to that and the language could be quite base, base. Um, if you look at the first syllable, for example. Um, so even though we've got this sort of childish, innocent sense of, of them before they were in love, it's also the sense in which the, um, the relationships that he had prior to meeting this, this, this true love were um, uh, insufficient. They were childish in the sense of being not adult, not grown up. They were lacking in maturity or lacking in being, you know, something, something meaningful. They were just simple, simple bodily pleasures in that way. Okay, twas so, but this old pleasures fancies be. But they, they, they were just sort of like um, simple pleasures that they had. If any of there any beauty I did see which I desired and got, twas but a dream of thee. So the pursuit of um, and 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 the, the 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 pursuit of pleasure and the gaining of pleasure was but a dream of thee. So the idea that pleasure as a shadow of love, of true love, is is really important in the poem. Now that's important right from the start in terms of context because one of the things it's said about this poem is it's anti-Petrarchan. What's that mean, Phil? Well, I'm going to tell you. 
So uh, Petrarchan love poetry in the Elizabethan period, so the period before the 17th century under Queen Elizabeth, the Elizabethan period, love was all about the hunt. You know, so it was about it was about the pursuit in that way. So what pleasures used to the pleasures that used to come from love weren't really explored. It was more the frustration felt by someone with unrequited love. That was a real sort of concern for Elizabethan love poets, this intense almost wonderful pleasure of unrequited love, of that, that true love of, of wanting but not getting. So what um, Dunn has done <laughs> is that he's taken that and, and reversed it right from the start in the first stanza. He's, imag he's, he's saying, well, right now we're in love, and he starts his poem back in the past, back in the past, before we were in love, what was it like? And he says, well look, when I used to, uh, beauty I did see which I desired and got, so I, I fulfilled lots of pleasures with other women, but it was just a dream of you. So he's, he's sort of uh, contrasting p the pleasures of perhaps sexual pleasures or bodily pleasures or the pleasure of pursuit or whatever, against the true nature of love which comes in the second stanza and this is a beautiful sort of present moment of love and you can see that in the language now good morrow to our waking soul so starts with that coordinating conjunction and new idea you know the structure of the poem suggesting here's now this new this not these these country pleasures not these childish pleasures but real true love and it's with this image of the good morning the waking up good morrow to our waking souls which watch not one another out of fear for love all love of other sights controls and makes one little room and everywhere. I mean, sometimes it's okay to just say, that's a really beautiful line. Um, makes one little room and everywhere. So this is where we get to a new sort of conceit, a new metaphysical conceit, which is like an analogy, a link between one thing and another. And so it's between this idea of discovery and love. So true love is an act of, act of discovery. It's almost like cartography. It's like charting the world. And of course, at this time in history, uh, we were you know, traveling all over the world making discoveries. And he says, well, love is like that. True love is like that. Let sea discoverers to new worlds have gone. Let maps to other worlds on worlds have shown. Let us possess one world. Each hath one and is one. So it's almost like it's an act of um, beautiful discovery of a whole world is, is true love. It's amazing that this guy wrote The Flea. I think that's what you should be thinking about this. This guy wrote The Flea, and yet what we have is this, this stanza which is absolutely focused on the awakening, the, the wonderful awakening that is true love. And we can look at this with the language again. Souls here, you know. Um, I've got um, worlds, worlds on worlds, repetition of that, um, and then oneness, and you know this idea of possessing one world. So, quite simply, we've got quite a lot of repetition, repetition. But the the key idea that's coming through is this idea of unity, the unity between the lovers. Whereas, of course, in the Petrarchan version that he's sort of moving against, when it was about someone pursuing someone else, there was no unity. It wasn't about lovers together. It was about almost like um, someone pursuing somebody else, like, um, like a chase in some way. This is much more about the unity of, of love, true love, and that's why we would say it's sort of a metaphysical idea. And then the final stanza brings together these ideas and, and opens up the poem to lots and lots more ideas. Once again, that idea of riffing on a simple idea of, of essentially uh, waking up with a loved one and, and making that something more important. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. My face in thine eye, thine in mine. So we've got this sort of parallel structure in the sentence there, in the line, and this imagery of seeing somebody else, very in, intimate imagery of seeing somebody else's face in your eye and them seeing their, um, um, their face in, in yours, etc, etc, etc. And true plain hearts do in the faces rest. Again, it seems complicated because the idea is complicated, but the language is actually quite monosyllabic, it's quite simple. A simple conversational almost style, but vaulting ideas, incredibly complicated ideas. Okay. Where can we find two better hemispheres? And he returns this questioning, these rhetorical questions. Where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west? Whatever dies was not mixed equally. So let's just stop there. Hemispheres is like a globe. So he's imagining the, the Earth as a globe. And yes, absolutely, at this time they discovered that the Earth was a sphere. They did know this. 
with two hemispheres. So the two lovers are like two parts of a globe, but without the sharp north or the declining west, better than a whole planet in that way. So again, this metaphysical conceit is sort of riffing on this idea that the lovers are like a whole world. Then, just for good measure, he gets in some alchemy, <laughs> which is, um, you might have heard of the idea, alchemy was this sort of medieval practice before the 17th century, for hundreds of years, they tried to create gold out of different metals. It's one of the bases for chemistry, really. Some of the discoveries that alchemists make, made, you can't do it, by the way. It's not possible to make um, gold out of other metals without, you know, some sort of nuclear issue. Um, Whatever, I'm not a scientist. Whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two lives be one, or thou and I, like so alike, love so alike, that none do slacken, none can die. So this idea that things only die if they're not of equal measure, this is one of the alchemical ideas, the idea of alchemists, early chemists. If our two loves be one, or thou and I love so alike, then none do slacken, none can die. So this idea that unity, unity equals the eternal so that love is eternal because it's equally mixed, there's an equal weighting of love. So this egalitarian idea of love that you've seen already in Othello, we can see it again in the 17th century contest here. So really what we've got is, is, is a really interesting romantic, sort of with a, with a, a small r, um, metaphysical exploration of love. It's anti petrarchan in the sense that it's not about the pursuit of love, it's not about the distance between lovers, it's about the wonders of the unity of love itself, exploring this conceit of uh, the lovers being like uh, discovery, being like a whole globe, being like alchemical attraction, being like unity in the entire cosmos. And then the whole poem being bright, brought again back towards the end. Love so light that none do, do slacken, none can die. The idea that love is a way of being uh, everlasting and eternal, which of course has got uh, religious connotations as well. So it's a lovely, lovely poem, only three stanzas, very unified structure, which would link to the idea that it's supposed to be a, a, a unified theme within it. We've got this very strange first stanza, which has these big rhetorical questions. What was it like before we loved with this sort of uh, strange, innocent sort of uh, um, imagery, but at the same time almost saying that, that the type of pleasures he used to pursue before he got true love was somehow um, not adult or somehow not uh, mature or something like those. It was, it was sort of a, a parochial country pleasure, nothing particularly um, developed. Whereas the true love he has now is about souls, it's about unity, it's this beautiful, beautiful imagery of one room being in everywhere. I mean, how beautiful an idea is that, that the, the two lovers together is like they've discovered a whole new world. And then the final stanza it explores and it becomes this what we might call very heterogeneous poem. So hetero genus just means that it's or heterogeneity it's just a really big poem bringing together lots and lots and lots of ideas from um, geography from cartography map making from uh, other ideas of uh, seven sleepers sleep den as a link to mythology um, to uh, the you know, understanding of um, uh, uh, what do we call it, uh, alchemy, to an understanding of astronomy and astrology, the idea of, of, of the whole universe really revolving around love, and of course that being a particularly interesting Christian idea that, that in love one can live forever. Right, you can tell I like this poem, can't you? Okay, cheers, bye. <laughs>